Reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 33 to 42. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Amen. Let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we are surprised sometimes when we read even obscure passages and find that it's absolutely relevant for what's going on in our lives at that very moment. So, Lord, we turn to your word this morning and we pray that your voice will be heard, that you will speak to us from it. Uh, We pray, Lord, that you will continue to take us deeper into you and help us to reflect your presence in our lives to those that come across us in our daily walk. Um, Lord, we thank you for your word and we pray that you will speak to us through it this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you're visiting with us today, we we welcome you, but uh, we want to let you know that we are part of doing a a series at the moment, so um, bear with us in that um, we can give you some catch-up on YouTube and that kind of thing, but uh, uh, we are looking at um, this marvelous uh, section of the Scriptures known as the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I was um, recently required to make a legal declaration which had to be witnessed by a commissioner of oaths. So I went along to the office with the paperwork uh, and then the oath was administered. Well, it wasn't quite that simple. Um, She started, and I said, I couldn't swear by Almighty God because it was against my religion. Uh, So she asked, well, what religion is that? And I said, I am a Christian. Well, she had a very puzzled look on her face. She just happened to have a Bible there. And uh, I showed her this passage that we were reading from in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus told his followers not to swear oaths, but to simply tell the truth. She'd never come across that before. (laughs) Uh, In practice, I had to affirm that what I was saying was true. That's uh, that's the way it is. The Sermon on the Mount was not given to vast crowds of uh, interested passers-by. It was given to a small group of committed disciples who had started following Jesus. So this isn't uh, for broadcasting, it's for narrowcasting. It is to those who have committed themselves to follow Jesus and who are determined to live according to the principles of the kingdom of heaven. It is the beginner's guide to being a disciple. 
how can people tell that we are followers or disciples of Jesus? In the olden days, it was so much easier, wasn't it? You, some, some of you who are my age and a bit older, you know, it was, it was so simple. No smoking, no drinking, no dancing. <laughs> the, the cry was, stop enjoying yourself, you're supposed to be a Christian. <laughs> but it's not about a whole list of uh, thou shalt nots. How can people today identify you as a disciple of Jesus Christ? What is distinctive about us as followers of Jesus? In this section, Jesus says that those of us who want to be part of the kingdom of heaven should cultivate integrity, kindness, and generosity. Now, why do people need to start sentences with, I wouldn't lie to you? <laughs> Ever heard that one? Uh, or they finish statements with, I swear to God. Have you come across that one? You know, when somebody wants to, when somebody says to me, and I I'll be, I'll be honest with you. My, my thoughts are what you're not normally honest. <laughs> no. mm. uh, well, when I was in school, I remember once uh, a, a friend who said, I swear on my mother's grave, he said. I pointed out his mother was still alive. <laughs> you know. If truth be told, and it should be, you don't need to reinforce your words with such phrases as long as you keep your word. And you develop a reputation as somebody who keeps their word or as somebody who doesn't. Simple as that. Let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. To be a Christian should be synonymous with being a man or woman of integrity. Say what you mean and mean what you say. At home, we need to show our children that we are men and women of integrity. As parents, we should never promise something that you know you cannot deliver. And never make a threat that you're not prepared to carry out. And let your children grow up in an environment where they know that you mean what you say. And parents need to support each other in the created of a culture of integrity within the home. Uh, a pastor once referred to his children as his primary source of sermon illustrations, uh, and yet I've always been determined to avoid using our children as sermon illustrations. Uh, honest, really. I, I won't lie to you. <laughs> <laughs> but Ruth and I had an agreement that when the children were growing up, uh, if one of us said something and that might be threatening a particular punishment in the heat of the moment, then the other backed it up. Now, uh, the children knew that if one of us said something, the other would not overrule it. We supported each other in keeping our word. There were times when the kids wished we didn't and wouldn't keep our word, but they knew that they uh, had parents of integrity, parents who kept their word. In work, when people play all sorts of games to pass the buck or to shift the blame, when making unrealistic promises are seen as a tactic to keep someone sweet in the short term, remember 
that we are playing this game of life according to a different set of rules. People may not like what we have to tell them, so we learn to say it in a kindly way. But at least they know that we are honest and men and women of integrity. Our words and our intentions are integrated. That's what integrity means. Our words and intentions are integrated. They fit together. As um, James says, Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. You need, all you need to say is a simple yes or no, otherwise you will be condemned. You know, good liars have to have good memories. And when you've got a memory like, um, you know, that thingy with all the holes in it, um, you know, or if you're a follower of Jesus, you need to cultivate a culture of integrity. We also need to cultivate a kind heart. Um, sometimes people are, are hurt, and when people are hurt, they can sometimes build up resentment and may even fantasize, you know, lie awake at night trying to figure out how they can get their own back. And uh, resentment can spiral upwards and erupt into an uncontrollable burst where that leaves uh, bystanders completely bewildered. I don't know if you've ever come across that. Um, But um, that's bad enough. But in some cultures, hurt and resentment erupts into violence, especially when alcohol is involved. You know, and um, uh, it's all, you, you know, there's, there's a buildup of resentment because somebody's hurt and it only needs a trigger and that trigger sets off a, a, a reaction which is completely out of proportion to the context in which it takes place. You know, it, it, it's, where did that come from is uh, the reaction of the people around. Now, when the Old Testament introduced the concept of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which sounds to us a little bit on the barbaric side. It was to limit revenge. That's the purpose of it. Um, Before that, you had unlimited retaliation. Uh, Revenge could escalate into a feud and spread into families and clans and nations. (coughs) And so to say an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, was to say, enough. You know, don't go any further. Limit the extent of your retaliation to the actual hurt you have experienced. And so, unlimited revenge gave way to a limited retaliation. That was the purpose of an eye for eye tooth for tooth. But Jesus says, don't seek any revenge. Don't fight fire with fire. Don't play by this world's stupid rules. Remember that you are citizens of heaven, and just as God treats us with great mercy, that's the way that we are to treat others. Don't worry about losing sight in the face of people. Live according to the highest standards of the kingdom of heaven and remember that everything you do and everything you say is seen and heard by the king of heaven. He knows what really went on and he knows the motives of all those that were involved. Have you ever been treated unfairly? Well, let me tell you, that's no excuse to treat others unfairly. You know, just take it on the chin, you know, and, uh, and move on. You know, even to those who are unfair to you. They're expecting you to retaliate. They're expecting you to, to be resentful. Don't give them the pleasure. You know, just don't 
play by this world's rules. Don't behave badly, behave better. Be kind. Back in the first century, um, Judea and Galilee were under military occupation. A Roman soldier could tell anyone to carry a burden for them. You know the story of Simon of Cyrene. He was pulled out of the crowd, compelled by a Roman soldier to carry the cross for Jesus. And a, a soldier could make a civilian carry something for one Roman mile. Now that's the background to what Jesus is talking about when he says, go the extra mile. If someone has power or authority to make you go one mile, then you take hold of that power and that authority because you have the power, you have the authority to go that second mile. They can't make you do that. You can make yourself do that. If someone has the legal right to make you do something which itself is legal, you know, nobody has the legal right to make you do something that's illegal, but if they have the legal right to make you do something that's legal, you know, a boss, blessed be their name, and, or some sort of, um, you know, official, don't just do what you have to. You know, resent in every second but go the extra mile. Go over and above what you have to do. And be kind and be helpful. Don't even wait to be asked. You know, if you see a need or if you see that uh, something needs to be done, just do it without being asked. You know, train yourself to be kind. Cultivate a kind heart. So we are to uh, cultivate integrity. And we are to cultivate kindness. We're also told in this passage to cultivate a generous attitude. And when Jesus says, Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. He's reflecting the teaching of the Old Testament law. Um, which we find in Deuteronomy. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God has given you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them. Rather, be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. Uh, now, this, is, uh, this limits, of course, to helping people that are of your particular uh, tribe or clan or nation. But um, when Jesus says it, there's no restriction on who you should help, who you should be kind towards, who you should be generous towards. And one of the best books that I've ever read on the Sermon on the Mount, uh, it was a, an old book written by Dr. Clarence Jordan. You've all heard of Dr. Jordan, I knew I can tell by looking on your face. You know, uh, well, oh, he was an interesting, he was such an interesting character. Um, he was a farmer who, he was a farmer who got a, a PhD in New Testament Greek. You know, I mean, that's an interesting combination, isn't it? Uh, his farm was named Koinonia, and, which means partnership or, or fellowship. And it became a haven for black families during the 1940s and 50s when uh, a lot of black families were being turfed off the land by um, increasing mechanization on, on farms. Um, he, this was in Georgia, down in the deep south of uh, the USA. Now, um, Dr. Clarence Jordan was the inspiration for a system where these families helped each other to build simple homes on the farm, some 400 acres, this farm, uh, and they were given interest-free loans to pay for the materials. 
You know, he based it all on the, the Old Testament uh, teaching like this, you know, um, uh, be open-handed, don't be tight-fisted, don't charge you a, a fellow citizen's interests, you know, that, that, don't sell food at a profit for somebody who's poor, and all that kind of thing. And um, this, this concept evolved into an organization called Habitat for Humanity. I don't know if you've ever come across that, but um, Jimmy Carter um, is still actively involved in building houses for poor people uh, through the, the organization called Habitat for Humanity. And they followed these principles of, uh, that, that were first taught um, or, or first extracted from the scriptures by Clarence Jordan uh, and using these same principles of providing interest-free mortgages, they have built over 800,000 homes worldwide. They, they've housed something like 2 million or more people, you know, using this simple system. And that was um, Clarence Jordan who brought, wrote this book on the Sermon on, on the Mount. Um, one of the stories that uh, I read about him was, um, uh, that he didn't write this himself, but it was a story that was um, written about him where he asked his brother Robert. Now Robert became a, a state senator and was a justice on the George, uh, Georgia State Supreme Court. And uh, he was a, a lawyer, an attorney, and uh, Clarence asked his brother if he would act as their attorney. And Robert said, I can't do that. You know my aspirations, this is before he became a senator. I might lose my job, my house, everything I've got. So Clarence said to him, well, we might lose everything too. It's different for you, Robert uh, responded. Why? Asked Clarence. You and I joined the church the same Sunday as boys. The preacher asked, Do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? What did you say? Robert replied, I follow Jesus up to a point. Clarence then said to him, Could that point be by any chance the cross? I follow him to the cross, said Robert, but not on the cross. I'm not getting myself crucified. Then replied Clarence, I don't believe that you are a disciple. You're an admirer of Jesus. You ought to go back to that church you belong to and tell them you're an admirer, not a disciple. Robert responded, well now, if everybody like me did that, we wouldn't have a church, would we? To which Clarence uh, applied the coup de grace. The question is, do you have a church? Uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, the eventual outcome of this was that um, Robert became a disciple. And uh, uh, one of his great boasts was that his brother Clarence was the greatest Christian that he'd ever met. That's great, isn't it, that a brother should say that of another. Well, we believe in a God who is generous. One of the first verses that we learn as children is John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. As followers of the generous God, we encourage each other as disciples to be generous. Uh, some of you have come across, well, you know, I, I've got no qualms about this. Putting aside a proportion of our income to give to God, learning, if you like, to tithe by giving 10% of your income to, to the church is the beginner's guide to giving, the beginner's guide. It helps us to set achievable goals irrespective of whatever income we have. 
Um, you know, I've, I've come across a number of people who told me that they couldn't possibly afford to tithe. And so I said to them, well, try 2% then. You know, and within, within a very short space of time, they, they found that if you can do two, you can do four. If you can do four, you can do eight. And before you know it, uh, they, they are well. And, and in, in a sense, um, although it helps us to achieve, achieve, well, uh, to, to achieve goals, uh, it's not an end in itself. Tithing is not an end in itself. Tithing is there to teach us the spirit of generosity. You see, if we don't learn to manage our income and set some of our income aside, we will not have the means to be generous. So that's why tithing or giving 10% of your income is a useful staging point to cultivate a generous attitude beyond any religious law. So in these few verses that we read earlier, Jesus encourages his disciples to cultivate a character of integrity, a kind heart, a generous attitude. Now, you've got to ask yourself the question, is this normal or is it exceptional? It should be for disciples of Jesus, this should be the norm. This should be the marks, the distinctive traits of discipleship. These are the marks of a Christian disciple that show up in our lives at home and in work uh, with the family and with the wider community. I can't give you a list of thou shalts and thou shalt nots, uh, I, I'm glad to say. We have to figure it out for ourselves how to apply these principles to every aspect of our lives. And I would say to you, concentrate on cultivating the soil, the attitude, you know, what, what's inside the character, and let the practical applications grow from there. So let me summarize. It's not on the screen, this. Be truthful. Is that reasonable enough? Be truthful. Be kind. And be generous. Clarence Jordan once said, the measure of a Christian is not in the height of his grasp, but in the depth of his love. Let's join together in prayer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead us in a short prayer. I'm just going to leave it open at that point um, uh, before I, I bring it to a close again. I just want you to reflect on, on all that you've heard this morning. I want you to think about the, the kindness of God. I want you to think about the generosity of God to you. I want, to think, I want you to reflect on how you live in response to all that he has done for you. And, um, you know, let's thank him this morning. Don't be afraid to, you know, you can stand up or sit down and, and just pray out a prayer out loud. Just thank him for what he's done and ask him for help to live the Christian walk. I've got a heavenly father. We thank you for all that you've done. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to live our lives in response to all that you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, that you've not given us a long list of religious do's and don'ts, a list of things that we have to follow if we are to be religious, but rather you've called us into a relationship with you. And we pray, Lord, that we will spend so much time with you that we will absorb your characteristics, that we will absorb your qualities. And when people, deal, when people have any dealings with us, that they will 
see something of you living through us. In Jesus' name. God, our Heavenly Father, our one desire is to be everything that you want us to be. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to lay aside any um, personal ambition that we have or any insistence that we have our rights or uh, stand up for, for what we believe um, is, is ours by, by right. In, Lord, we, we simply ask that you will help us to live completely under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That he won't be Lord simply as a, a, a title, but will be Lord in reality of every aspect of our daily lives. 
Um, Lord, we pray that there will be integrity in our lives so that uh, the way that we are inside a place of worship is no different to the way that we are outside. And uh, we just pray, Lord, that we will live a life that honors you wherever we are and whatever we are doing. Whether we are in public or uh, alone, we pray that you will help us to behave with integrity. Help us to be kind to those that we encounter. And uh, Lord, give us generous hearts to, that, is, uh, that are willing to help other people. And Lord, we, we want to thank you that you have treated us with great love. You've treated us with great generosity. You've been kind when we haven't deserved it. But we thank you, Lord, that uh, we have been recipients of your love. Help us to be carriers of your love. Help us to convey your love to all those that are around us. And Lord, we pray for all those who need to know that you love them, to that need a special touch from you at this time. And we pray for all those who are sick or those who are looking after the sick. We, um, we pray, Lord, for those who are um, facing uh, further medical uh, tests and so on. Um, Lord, we pray for our brother uh, Jeff um, this morning. We, we ask, Lord, that you will um, be with him. We pray that you will be with all those that just need to be assured that your loving kindness is with them at all times. Lord, um, help us to be kind to others, but help us to be aware of your kindness to us. We ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.